Welcome to this presentation on the conservation of Trungpa Rinpoche's art. We are uh, very fortunate today to have with us Anne Sheftel, who is a fellow of the International Institute of Conservation, fellow of the American Institute of Conservation, and member of the Canadian Association of Professional Conservators. Anne works internationally for cultural and governmental sectors in museums, universities, Dharma centers, and monasteries. She directs treasurecaretaker.com and has researched and worked in monasteries and museums since 1970. So without further ado, Anne, over to you. Welcome to everyone. Some of you are meditation students of Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. Some of you are with us today for this Zoom because you love tankas. You maybe you're an art conservator, an art collector, or perhaps you're a meditation student of other teachers. Welcome to everyone joining us today. Thank you to Ocean for hosting our Zoom. Thank you to our funders. And thank you, especially to Claire Ryan, Jean Reardon, and Rochelle Whitehorn for your help and support for this presentation. Here's the guide for our time together today. Yes, we're going to go through all of this today. Chukim Trungpa Rinpoche was a traditionally trained Tonka painter and meditation master. When he moved to the West, his painting methods and materials changed due to lack of availability of traditional colors and binder. Significantly, his own artistic expression expanded into flower arranging, art installations, photography, etc. Trungpa Rinpoche was very interested in science and our work together on preservation of his own paintings was detailed and specific as he gave me direct instructions on how he wanted me to save them, please. For example, the reproductions of his paintings are from original paintings that I restored according to his specific instructions. This presentation includes images and discussion of the approach of a trained conservator to working with a living artist who gives clear instructions on the legacy care of his own art. I worked with him on preservation of most of his own artworks and entered into deep discussion about preservation of traditional Buddhist art and into the nature of impermanence as it relates to art conservation. Before I began working with Trungpa Rinpoche, in 1970, I began researching sacred art in monasteries in India and Nepal and interviewing Buddhist teachers and traditional painters and sculptors. For example, in 1970, I interviewed Gelek Rinpoche at Tibet House, Delhi, and Kamchul Rinpoche of Tashichang, the great painter and meditation master. In order to preserve traditional and evolving sacred art treasures, documentation and technical information is crucial to share it with this generation and coming generations. In non-pandemic times, I work with Treasure Caretaker Training, a nonprofit, and we lead on-site preservation workshops for nuns, monks, community members, scholars, artists, etc. The composition of each workshop differs according to the location our partners, including oh, UNESCO, Government of India, Royal Government of Bhutan, and others. Risk assessment is an important part of each workshop, 
and the categories are adjusted for monastery life. Preservation of historical treasures in monasteries depends on knowledge of the caretakers within the monastery, not on external efforts. You know, risks and hazards are taught in the West as a model for heritage preservation. It's mostly theoretical, but almost every risk and hazard occurs in a monastery and frequently. I do love researching and working in monasteries and have done so, yes, since 1970. In monasteries, we work together on the preservation of texts, tankas, and everything else that a monastery or nunnery considers sacred. In 1970 in India, I encountered the 16th Karmapa with his main disciples. Visited monasteries in Nepal, as I said, met Gaelic Rinpoche and the 8th Kamtul Rinpoche. A few years later, when I asked the 16th Karmapa about my science-based conservation work for Buddhist treasures, he said, quote, this is your Dharma work for this lifetime, but don't do it for the money, unquote. Then I went to Trungpa Rinpoche and I said, yes, but then how can I pay my rent and buy my groceries? And Trungpa Rinpoche replied, the karmapa meant, quote, don't do it just for the money, unquote. This is Gaelic Rinpoche. In 1970 at Tibet House in Delhi, he taught me oh, so much about tanka fakes, how tanka fakes are made, and all about the ethics of selling sacred art on the marketplace. This is the eighth Kamtul Rinpoche. He was a friend of Trungpa Rinpoche in Tibet. He's mentioned in the book, Born in Tibet. I was so fortunate that he painted this tanka for me from a vision in India. In 1973 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I brought it to Trungpa Rinpoche and said, what do you think about this tanka that your friend painted? He looked carefully at the tanka. He suggested how I could relate to it in my meditation practice, where to place it in my home, and said, as an artistic comment, oh, quote, bring it back to him and tell him to finish the decorative details on the boots, unquote. The thing is that both Kamtul Rinpoche and Trungpa Rinpoche were both incarnate teachers who were recognized as rebirths in their own tradition. And they were also trained from childhood in tanka painting. They worked in contemporary media and they had to adjust to the time and place where they lived. Both gave me specific instructions on the purpose and conservation of their own paintings and also other forms of Dharma art. What makes the artwork of Trungpa Rinpoche so interesting is that it is terma, translated as treasure teachings. The 17th Karmapa is also incarnate, born, and a meditation master, scholar, and accomplished artist. In traditional Tanka style iconography, and also he works with a range of currently available methods and materials, largely digital. This is his painting of Padmasambhava. Chukim Trungpa Rinpoche loved these tankas of Milarepa. He actually went to Sweden and stayed in the museum it was the older one, not the building they have now. He lived in it for a few days so that he could spend all the time looking at these tankas of Milarepa. I was fortunate to be invited by that museum to document their tankas and give conservation advice. Most of these tankas were collected by the Swedish explorer Sven Hedin. 
This is one of the tankas that Trung Rinpoche really liked. And the lighting is a technical aspect we use as conservators. We light from the side sometimes, it's called raking light. So we can see the condition of the painting, both its support, the cloth it's painted on, and the ground and paint layers. This is me at that museum examining the Miller at the Tonkas. You could tell I'm really happy. I would ask people about if they remembered when he was there years ago. Part of my professional work as an art conservator when I'm not in the monasteries is again consultation for museums on their sacred art. I'm called in to work closely with museum staff for conservation examination and to document and design treatments and preservation parameters for their tankas. My interest in tankas began in museums. In the 1950s, that is the early 1950s, my second grade public school class hopped on the subway, New York, and took a class trip to the Museum of Natural History, and we looked at their tanka display. That museum is now one of my clients. Many conservators, for those of you on this Zoom that aren't conservators, who work either on paintings or textiles or objects. But I've been fortunate to work with many different media, especially with the form of tanka, which is composite and has mm, painting, textiles, wood, metal, so many things. I also do risk assessment and disaster planning within monasteries. Tankas, as you'll see, have, have both textiles and paintings. In this, I'm doing some consolidation and very minor in painting on a historic tanka. I get to lecture about Tankas and Buddhist art preservation lot. This is in Los Angeles. And this was the first time that I actually said amongst a group of my colleagues that I was Buddhist. Before that, I didn't feel that it would have been received well. So I actually showed pictures that I'm showing today and said, oh yes, I've been Buddhist since 1970. And uh, it, well, the world didn't fall apart. It was quite interesting. It was at this point in the lecture. A, sister, a Vajra sister of mine, a friend, took this picture. She was there. Beginning in the 1970s, in the early 1970s, I conducted inventories of the Buddhist treasures at Karma Choling, Rocky Mountain Dharma Center, local city meditation centers around North America, and also by request of the treasures in Trungpa Rinpoche's home. I found this painting crumpled up in a steamer trunk in the basement of his Boulder home. I brought it to him and he seemed really upset and asked me to quote, save it please, unquote. I discussed with him conservation treatment options, very technical. And after we agreed on a course of action, I enacted humidification and stabilization treatment to relax and flatten the crumpled painting on cloth. He asked me to paint out all of the damage from it being crumpled up in the bottom of the steamer trunk. We discussed which paints to use, and I promised to do it at a later date, unspecified. This is a picture of it on the left in its original framing package. This is a print that fits nicely into the original frame that we put it in. This is painted in the Eastern Tibetan style of painting. And that means it has thin washes of color and sharp detail in a vast and spacious landscape. This is one of the paintings that is in the rare category of artwork by a meditation master who's also a master painter, who paints a tanka from his own meditation 
and vision. It's a terma painting. Working with a living artist is beneficial for informed conservation treatment. Working with a traditionally trained artist is beneficial for a conservator to become informed about methods and materials. Working with a traditionally trained artist who also worked with more contemporary media and is communicative about his wishes for conservation of these artworks is very rare for a conservator. For conservators, it's so valuable to have dialogue with living artists and especially valuable to discuss an artist's own intention. In this case, how it incorporates the Buddhist approach to both the creation and preservation of his own artwork, especially because impermanence is a core teaching of Buddhism and working with impermanence can be very challenging in conservation. Let's talk about two tankas that Trungpa Rinpoche asked me to, quote, please protect it from the adoring hands of my students, unquote. The two are popular in their reproductions, Padma Sambhava and Yeshe Tsogal or Yumka Dechen Galmo. This image shows you one of the first museum quality shadow box framing designs for tankas. This is how it was framed as Trungpa Rinpoche wished. The painting was removed from the protective frame and from its original Tonka textile mounting when it was photographed for reproduction. And the, the paintings were never returned to the traditional textile mounts of his own choice or the framing package of his own choice. For his own paintings, in his own words, he wanted me to protect them from his devoted students who didn't know much about conservation and wanted to touch the tankas and other of his paintings, perhaps to get blessings. His traditional tanka paintings had been rolled and unrolled and crunched by his students during transport and usage. Again, in 1975, we designed the shadow box installation that set the tankas deep into the frame using ultraviolet filter plexi. Yet it presented a traditional appearance of these traditional tanka forms. This shadow box installation for tankas was subsequently used in museums with tanka collections. In the late 1970s, for example, I worked on tankas in a museum. Some of them are still in these shadow box frames. They've withstood decades of storage, shipping, handling, and display. This is a working image in the 1970s of when we installed the Padmasambhava Tanka into the shadow box frame. The red arrow shows you the ultraviolet filter plexi. You could see how deep it is in the frame. This was his wish for its presentation and preservation. The Tanka form is really a sculpture, it's not a painting. It has so many components, mm, painting, textile, wood, metal, leather. It's very three-dimensional. It's definitely a sculpture. So that's why the deep shadow box frame is necessary. I first met this Padmasambhava Tanka in the early 1970s at the Visual Dharma exhibit in Boston. Here's the catalog entry. A few years later, here are my type notes about the condition of that very tanka at Karma Choling in Vermont. These notes may look boring to you, but conservators take a lot of notes on condition. I think the point here again is that his style was unique to him, special, because it was created from his meditation vision and his artistic expertise. Therefore, it's important in a technical way 
to preserve his creations as he wished. In our discussions, he was specific about me using the scientific approach to conservation to protect his own paintings. In this image, you can see the Venerable Trunga Rinpoche viewing the Padmasambhava and Yeshe Sogyal Tankas by Trungpa Rinpoche in my conservation lab in Halifax, Nova Scotia. They were close friends in Tibet and later in North America. In this image, the paintings are still in their original textile mountings in the full Tanka form as chosen by the artist Trungpa Rinpoche. Trungpa Rinpoche, whenever he came to Halifax, used to visit me because he wanted to see what Tankas I had I was working on in the shop. He was a frequent visitor. He would come by with monks and they wouldn't even really have tea. They would just go and look at the Tonkas and talk about them for hours in Tibetan. This is how the paintings were meant to be seen as a full Tonka form surrounded by the original textile mounting. This image is recreated with uh, the original textile mounting and a, a print. His approach to the preservation of his own work was very practical, although he repeatedly reminded me not to believe in inter eternalism. Eternalism, the downfall of conservators. He reminded me that nothing should last forever. Nothing will last forever. And but also that I shouldn't fall into nihilism thinking that in that case, nothing matters. Yes, he really enjoyed discussing the way in which the ethics of conservation are understood in the West from his particularly unique perspective. As conservators trained in the 70s, we were trained to do the minimal and not add anything to the object that would change or add to its appearance, except in cases when it was well required by the artist, by the curator. Yes, it, there were a lot of in cases of discussions. When a Buddhist teacher hopes, is, hopes that his own artwork will survive in order to inspire future generations on the path of meditation and compassion, he could specify that a process of complete restoration is the appropriate way to conserve his or her own artwork. The artist's original intention can be seen as a key approach to conservation. When I asked him questions about reversibility and authenticity when working on his own artwork, he explained that understanding impermanence from a Buddhist point of view can shift traditional Western science-based conservation ethics that I was working from in the 1970s. However, science is really important in this work. Again, in 1975, when we placed his tankas into the protective deep frames, he told me that if the paintings were ever to be restored in the future, he wanted me to, quote, paint out the damage on these and any other, other of his paintings. He even chose what kind of paint I should use for this. Usually this isn't my approach to paint out all the damage, but it was the artist's wishes. Usually we choose to stabilize the condition of a painting and leave the evidence of historical usage. But he wanted the iconography of his vision paintings to be unobstructedly visible for those who viewed them. At that time, and at a time in the future. This is significant. Therefore, years later, when his family and the community wanted reproduction of his paintings available to everyone, I was asked to remove the paintings from the safety of their shadow boxes to stabilize and in paint. I remembered his stated wishes on how he wanted his paintings to look. We even discussed what kind of brush strokes I would use, as well as the type of paint. 
The reproductions that are for sale now look almost perfect and undamaged. The original paintings are now framed in Western style frames, flat and without their textile mountings. These pictures that you see are sort of, usually we have before, during and after pictures. These pictures that you see are the during pictures of the before, during and after spectrum. You can see the damage. The damage you see comes from the tankas being rolled and unrolled through the years, and also people carrying them in the middle, crunching the painting portion. If you look behind me, that is the original textile mounting of the Padmasambhava painting by Trungpa Rinpoche. This is exactly how it looked originally when we put together the framing package. He even chose the color of the fabric. In this re reconstruction, I have used a reproduction that just about fits in perfectly. So for theirs that those that were there, so for those that saw it in the 1970s in its full form, this might be very exciting to see it back together again. Trungpa Rinpoche's three protector paintings, Ekajati, Mahakala, and Vajrasadu, actually were blessed on the back. They had suffered a lot of damage from travel and poor quality framing in their history. This is the blessing on the back, and it shows the residue of poor quality tape used in framing. The prints, the reproductions look almost perfect without damage. As I in-painted, as we call it, to only paint in areas of loss, never put a speck of paint over the original painting, we call it in-painting. I in-painted them as the artist had requested me to do, so they would appear almost completely undamaged. And that's why the reproductions look so perfect. This is the original. This painting on the cover of the Reign of Wisdom book was given to Trungpa Rinpoche by a student. When it was given, it was in a full tanka form, it was quite large. It was in very fragile condition. I asked Trungpa Rinpoche how he would like me to conserve it, how far he wanted me to go with the conservation treatment. We agreed that I would stabilize the structure of the painting. Then he explained that he wanted me to compensate or in-paint some of the damage but not all of it, and he was quite selective about which damage he wished me to leave as visible. On the left is a black and white high contrast image that I took at the time of how damaged the original painting really was. For example, I was requested to in-paint on the gold bell and dorje. It had been previously been in-painted when the tanka was received. Well, it had previously been repainted. And it's interesting also that Trinpa Rinpoche requested me to paint out only one of the two areas of water damage. If you look on the left side of the painting, as you can see it in the black and white, you can see that there was a lot of damage from water dripping down, probably in the monastery. And on the right, the damage is greatly reduced. There's a big vertical lines of damage I'm talking about is greatly reduced. And so Trungpa Rinpoche asked me to reduce and almost completely paint out, but not totally, the left area of vertical water damage and just reduce 
but still leave partially visible the right area of vertical water damage. You can see the difference between on the left and on the right. He also asked me to in-paint in most of the damage on the face and arms, but not all of it. He was really specific. Amongst the relics from the Sirmang Monastery, which were his, is the skull of Naropa. You can see images of the Sirmang relics on the Shambhala Archives website. In the 1980s, I was privileged to work with the relics, and especially the skull of Naropa. I worked to stabilize the loss of painting on the inside of the skull. It was flaking off. The work was done under magnification. Here's an image of that. It was a serious microscope. That's the skull and an image of the painting inside. You can see that these images are copyrighted. Here's a detail of the painting inside the skull. You can see areas of damage. What we do now is we use post capture apps on our phones which can highlight areas of damage instead of carrying around lots of light sources so that we can highlight uh, underdrawing and layers of paint etc and losses we use post capture apps and we can learn a lot about paintings and uh, damage and strengths through using them I used this post capture app on my phone on the previous image that I used of the skull of Naropa when I was working on it in the 80s. If you're interested in this, I can give you the reference to it. The next project I want to share with you is the great Vajradhara Tanka. Let's meet great Vajradhara Tanka. This tanka was the painting of the master painter, Sherab Paltin Biru. He painted it for the meditation hall in Boulder. This is a picture of him actually painting it. This painting of Vajradhara was highly empowered. This is a picture of the 16th Karmapa putting gold hand on his handprints. This is the highest form of blessing that a teacher can do, handprints. And there's an inscription and everything. This Vajradhara Tanka was highly blessed for the shrine room in Boulder, Colorado. If you're interested in empowerments, they bring the energy of the deity down to the materiality form of a sacred art, tangible sacred art form. So here, this is called transmitted light. The light is placed behind the painting you're looking at. And it shows you where the blessings on the back relate to the painting on the front. You can see the handprints and the seed syllables. If you'd like a copy of this, just let me know, please. The decision was made that the large tanka was to be relocated and replaced. So I was asked to help stabilize the condition and prepare it for transport. I conducted a conservation condition examination of it at the time, did some cleaning and some men's. It's really good to be able to work with both paintings and textiles. And I invited scholars and devotees to come and look at it closely. This is a translator, Jules Levinson, doing some translating of the inscription. This tanka was well blessed. And actually, many people feel that the reverse, the back, is more important than the painting on the front. The condition of the tanka, because it was so large, 
showed up in the different examination photos I did, including this. Well, it was rolled up and transported safely. Then I did some cleaning of other Shrine Room treasures. We're getting towards the end of our time together, but I wanted to share with you, I am here Mugpo. This is such an exciting project. It was a really interesting and challenging conservation scenario because this is one of Trinpa Rinpoche's calligraphies. He calligraphed it on the wall of the first Buddhist center in Halifax, Nova Scotia, on three dark colored panel board pieces that were painted white. And uh, yes, he painted on top of the wall painting with ink. His intention was for the large calligraphy to serve as a welcome and a blessing for people to come meditate there. When the center outgrew the small office space and moved, they pried off two of the three wallboard panels. One was structural. This is an image of the two panels on display in then the larger Buddhist center in Halifax. Years later, the Pier 21 Museum wanted to have an exhibit of the Buddhist community in Nova Scotia. And so they would wanted to have the full three panels. Right. So I was requested to reconstruct the missing panel. Using period photographs of the room, we used computer assisted imaging to change the angle of the photograph image and then project it onto new panel that had been primed to match the original aged white. I wanted to use color that matched but would not change. Therefore, I used paints, especially formulated for art conservation use. I did not use ink. The results were highly successful. This is an, well, it's a documentation of how it was done. I'd like to thank the really talented graphic designer, Erica Alanak, who worked on the vectoring and projecting, projection of the image. Thank you, Erica. It was quite the process. You can see the computer in the front and then the projection of it onto the new panel right next to the original panels. I traced the projection and then using images of the original recreated the missing calligraphy. Now this is it. I was only able to do that because I was so familiar with his brush strokes, how he did calligraphy, how he held the brush, what kind of brush strokes he did when he was painting with a small brush, with a calligraphy brush. Therefore, I could recreate them. First, we did a tracing of the projection. Then I had blow ups of images of that were taken from a photograph, historic photograph of the original. So I could see exactly the proportions and how he um, did his strokes. In other words, the up, the down, the pressure, the lack of pressure, the release, everything. And this is how it looked at the end. Please note that I requested that when the three panels were on display at Pier 21, that signage clearly identified that this panel was not original. I'm working here in painting some damage on the seal at the end of the calligraphy and the original. The last group of Trinpa Rinpoche's art that we have time to talk about today, although there are so many more, are his calligraphies on paper. He was an accomplished calligrapher, and he truly enjoyed the process 
as well as the products. His skillful calligraphies are collected and reproduced. These unique calligraphies that I'm going to show you were saved from a garbage can in a hotel. I actually took them out of the garbage can. After a meditation program in 1981, it's held in a hotel in Lake Louise, after everyone had departed, I went to the suite in the hotel where he and his family had been staying, and I found these in the garbage can waiting for the maid to add them to the hotel garbage to be burned. He defined the area of the hotel where his family was staying with these calligraphies. They had the room number and a description of who was staying in the room. For example, his wife and a calligraphy that said one room was the library, one room was the kitchen, etc. It would be really good to keep the collection of these room name signs together. They're not only unique and skillful calligraphy, but they're a tangible part of the history of the community. And it would be wonderful to keep this collection of calligraphies together that I plucked out of the garbage can after the program. This is one of them. That's not part of the over the door room calligraphies, but this has a seal and it was also plucked out of the garbage can. It's quite unique. It's another one, quite beautiful. This is a picture of more of my yellow type notes from the 1970s. And these notes are about poor quality framing of his calligraphies at a meditation center. Then like now, safe framing is so important for calligraphies, for paintings and reproductions. It only takes some knowledge to know what to ask for. The Buddhist tenant of impermanence challenges our traditional view of Western conservation, which is concerned with the stabilization and limitation of change. From a traditional Tibetan Buddhist point of view, impermanence is a fundamental truth. Change is inevitable in life and in life of an art form, too. However, different Buddhist teachers and artists that I have interviewed on this topic since 1970 have interpreted the relationship between impermanence and preservation of sacred art with diverse approaches. There is really not one answer here. In unique cases where the living artist can be interviewed, the approach can be in accord with the artist's original intentions and the purpose of the work. With Trungpa Rinpoche's art in the scope of centuries of Buddhist art, it's fairly contemporary. If his works were centuries old and very degraded with usage and age, then the viewpoint might be more complicated. However, there's no way to simplify and conclusively state that the interpretation of impermanence, how it affects and how it may guide the art conservator working on Buddhist sacred art. It's very difficult to simplify that. I'm continuing to collaborate with living traditionally trained artists now working in diverse media to develop conservation treatment plans according to their own wishes. Do you have conservation questions about your own tankas? About a calligraphy that you own? Perhaps your refuge or bodhisattva name calligraphy? please feel free to contact me and you'll find that our website has lots of information for you as well. 
During the pandemic, we're in touch with our monastery and community colleagues through phone, message apps, and emails. And we often receive confidential requests for preservation advice in the current situation. We're also presenting Zooms on preservation topics specific to monasteries and communities and for my museum colleagues. We're writing and publishing online and free of charge, Preservation of Buddhist Treasures Resource, written in response to your questions and illustrated with images from monasteries and Dharma centers. Each chapter is reviewed by conservators, scientists, scholars, and a monk or nun. You can find this resource for your own use at www.treasuresresource.com. Thank you very much. Please send us your questions via email. I've included links to some of our videos and publications. Buddhist store, etc. I hope you find them useful. And now, perhaps we have time for one or two questions. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Chase has a question. Chase, hello, Chase. Hi, Anne. So glad Hi. Good to see you. Hello to both of you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm curious about um, the the parts where Trunk Rinpoche. I think the Tonka that was on the cover of Reign of Wisdom, where there were like the the water, the water damage, and he was very particular about which streak. Did, did he did he say, mention anything about why he was leaving some of the damage and why or was it just kind of a mystery? It's a mystery. You can imagine that I did ask. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. The thing about in painting is that you use tiny little dots of color. It's like pointillism, in order to get that effect of of no damage without putting a speck of paint on the original. You're just painting in the losses areas of paint loss. And it's really, really slow. And I would ask him, should I go further? Should I go further? And he was absolutely specific that he wanted me to paint out one of the lines, the vertical lines of water damage, but not the other. But yet he wanted me to reduce the other. And yes, he was very specific and I'm sorry, I did not ask why. <laughs> I did not ask that question. Chase, you should have been around and you could have asked him why. Thank you. Appreciate I just kept at it and I received a lot of guidance of in paint this, but not the, don't change that. It is quite interesting. What do you think, Chase? My first instinct is that maybe he wanted like the age of the piece to show that it was not something that was completely immaculate, that it had a history to it. But it's dangerous to guess, I think, probably. Anyone else have a guess about that? Walter, what do you think? I have no idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> I did not ask why. That would be my guess is that he wanted to kind of have it half and half from looking too repainted, but, you know, keep that little bit of age. That'd be my guess, too. Well, I think I noticed that uh, one of the streaks went through the face of one of the figures. And uh, it might be disrespectful to the lineage guru. That's a wild guess. Maybe it has something to do with wabi sabi. Yes, I I want yes yes wabi sabi, and yet on his 
paint, his other paintings on his own paintings, the Yeshe, Yeshe Sogal, the Padmasambhava and the Protector paintings, and also the pillar painting, the one I found all rolled, crumpled up in the bottom of a steamer trunk. He was so specific that he wanted me to paint out the damage. He was really specific about it. He, he didn't want the fact that they had, his paintings had been treated badly or roughly and gotten damaged to affect the way that people in the future would look at them. And at that time, and still now, I'm so conservative. I'm a conservative conservator about not changing the way things are. Yet when you're working with a living artist, they have the right, they have the right to direct the conservation treatment of their own artwork. And he, as I said, he even chose what kind of paint I would use to do this. So therefore, when it came time for the reproductions, and that was a few years later, a few years later uh, I knew exactly what he wanted me to do and how far to go. That's why conservators like to document. And that's why we love working with living artists. And from a from a conservation ethics uh, perspective, using the paints that were um, advised uh, by the by the artist, um, would there be anything different that you would have done? I mean, because we look at it so differently from uh, from a conservation point of view and from the original artwork and on what we do. Yes, thank you for that question. He wanted me to use the finest watercolors available, which were at the time Windsor Newton. He wanted me to use media that was close to what he was using at the time. And he did not want special conservation paints. He definitely felt that the damage would be better disappeared using Windsor Newton watercolors and gouache. Of course, from a conservation point of view, we like to use materials that under examination leap out at you as not the original, whether it's with UV light or whatever. And in actual fact, a lot of restorers who work on tankas for uh, art dealers, for example, or private collectors do use Windsor Newton and other watercolors and gouache to disappear damage. But that wasn't why he, de he definitely liked the way that uh, I painted with those. It had to do with his knowledge of how I painted and and in painted and his own knowledge of how brush strokes work and how colors uh, match. It, was, it wasn't a simple decision. We had discussions about it. It's quite, quite interesting. And I find it, again, I feel privileged to work with meditation masters who are also accomplished painters. For example, I have spent hours with uh, um, Karmapa 17. And at one point I brought some conservation colors and I was saying, perhaps you could paint with these so they would last longer. And I brought some four zero brushes. And so we sat there with the four zero brushes and the conservation colors, it was blue. And we together painted a series of dots from large down to tiny. So he'd get a sense of how it was to paint with conservation colors instead of with the kind of not so good um, commercial colors that people were giving him to paint with. And uh, I still have the line of dots. It was really astounding, his command of the brush and how he could do the fine dots with a medium he's not used to. So it is a real privilege for a conservator to be able to work 
with a living artist. And in this case, because I work with sacred art, to work with a meditation master who is also an accomplished painter. And uh, Barbara Stewart has a question for you. Oh, um, hi, Ann. Um, I, how did uh, some of this art came from Sermon, yeah? Is that what you were saying? How did it survive the, the you know, the, that completely perilous journey with, you know, uh, that all that loss? How did any objects get through? Maybe Barbara, not... I'm so sorry. I'm the wrong person to ask that. Yeah. I, I wasn't there. Yeah, and it, I know you weren't there. Yeah. Conservators are so specific about, Craig can, can agree with me on this, that uh, we document what we know. And um, I'm so sorry. I can't answer that for you. You don't yeah. care. <laughs> Perhaps okay. ask Grant. Is, is there conservation? Is, let's see. Okay, question two. Was there ancient or at least old conservation in Tibet. I mean, this is sort of a Western discipline, isn't it? Or not? I mean, it seems like it is. That's such a good question. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> there is a, a Western aesthetic that has in the last few decades really influenced the care of some monastery tangible cultural heritage, i.e. art. And that comes from when you go to a museum, the old master paintings are absolutely perfect. There's not a speck of damage on them. And so people are educated to feel that art, especially old art, is perfect. Actually, the old master paintings in museums look that way because people like us make them look that way. But in fact, if you were to remove all of our work, the original artist probably wouldn't even been able to recognize them because they'd be damaged and there'd be a lot missing. So this is called the history of the object. Now, traditionally, centuries ago and up till just a few decades ago in monasteries, if a tanka, for example, were damaged, darkened perhaps by butter lamp, grease and, and incense grit, and by damaged by rolling and unrolling and being stored in a trunk, being crushed by other tankas, then it would not be thrown away. But a tanka painter would be called in to copy the iconography with primary colors. The primary colors come from the fact that they're earth colors, mineral colors, and also the primary colors carry the iconography. A tanka painter would come in and copy the older tanka and a new one would be made and that's how the iconography continued on in the Buddhist world through copies. Copying is definitely part of it. And the thing is that the old tankas were not cleaned or repainted as they are now so often. And never, never did they receive that. Perhaps the textile mountings were changed if they were torn or small repairs are made to the textile mounting. So the idea of perfection of sacred art forms centuries ago, and especially of tankas, is very not there, very different, especially with tankas that is so recent. And if you go to monasteries that are remote and not tourist, you can see venerable works of sacred art that are how uh, they carry the history of usage with them. There are newer statues also and newer paintings. It's a mixture. But the idea of perfection that we see now in terms of restoration of tankas for the commercial market and for museums never existed centuries ago, ever. And in actual fact, as Craig, who's my conservation colleague, can agree with, you can only cause serious damage, irreversible damage to a historic tanka and most historic paintings if you try to clean them and do that amount of overpainting to try to make it look like a new painting. It is impossible. So the only thing to do is to stabilize them, the condition, and then we can use the magic of the digital now 
take a picture of the original painting and through digital magic, you can bring it back. You can change it to how it might've looked when it was first painted. You can also hire a Tonka painter to do that. These days, you can also do digital magic on a high density print, high density digital file of the damaged Tonka painting. And then you can fool around with the digital file instead of doing serious damage to the original Tonka, trying to bring it back to what it might've looked like when it was first painted. So we're fully in favor of stabilization treatment for sacred art and digitizing images so you can see what it might have looked like when it was new. Plus, we love to give work to our Tonka painter friends. So you can call them in to copy the Tonka. With Tonkas especially, not everyone read in the past. So the painting, the image on the painting served as a guide to meditation, not only for those who couldn't read, but also the scholars. Mark Spakowski has a question. So you, you probably are, uh, I don't know if you deal with authenticity. You mentioned you had discussions about fake Tonkas and uh, market-driven Tonkas, but I was curious about the skull of Naropa. Uh, and uh, so I guess the original had this painting on the inside, looked like a Garuda. Is, is that right? It was a Garuda, right? I'll what? send you the image of it. Okay, yeah. And uh, do you have any knowledge or commentary on uh, whether it's, you know, how authentic it's considered? Like have people done radiocarbon dating or whatever? You don't know. I really think that that's a question for the guardians of it. For the people that own it and are caretakers of it in this lifetime, and that's not me. At that time, when I was doing stabilization treatment, I was only asked to do that and nothing else. So I really could not give an opinion about its actual date without doing extensive scientific testing. And in that, I feel really fortunate in that I have colleagues who are quite amazing in their conservation science techniques and approach including Jennifer Mass at Bard. And they do do analysis for me quite often. And their analysis is accurate and it's non-damaging. However, the guardian or current owner of something like the skull of Narupa would have to request that and deal directly with the conservation scientist in order for that to occur. Otherwise, as Craig would agree with me, conservators won't give an opinion about that unless we've done testing, sufficient testing, especially with an object like that, that's so important. Thank you. So that's the last question. Thank you. And I wanna thank you all for joining today. Uh, thank you, Walter and Joanne. And uh, I look forward to further discussion with everybody. Goodbye. Thank you, Anne. That, that was so interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.